We're going to continue our sermon series, Matters of Life and Death. So if you have your Bibles, let's look at 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll look at verses 13 to 18 together. And today, with the time we have, we're going to be talking about dealing with death. We've been talking a lot about what life means, but today we'll look at dealing with death. Every once in a while, you get a reminder that you're getting older. I got one this week. I was talking to somebody at lunch, and they said, hey, we've got this event coming up. Would you like to play Santa Claus? My wife was with me, (laughs) and she's been reminding me of that all week. I was like, no. No, I would not like to play Santa Claus. And I looked in the mirror, and I was like, I guess my beard is a little bit grayer and whiter than it used to be. This kind of looks like a bowl full of jelly right now. So, uh, Jimmy, you'll see me at the gym this week. I'm going back. I've decided not to shave because I've earned the gray, but at the same time, we, we're getting older, all of us. I'm reminded uh, President Adams, when he became a very old man, they were, a friend asked how his health was doing. And he answered that he was fine, but the house that he lived in was getting rickety and was not in good repair. And the truth is, all of us are decaying. We're getting older. One day we will face death, all of us. But we do not have to face it alone. We do not have to face it in fear. In fact, we can face it in Jesus Christ and be reminded that Jesus has already dealt with death. The thing that made death so scary for you and me, the uncertainty, the punishment that might follow, all of that was dealt with on the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, as Paul was trying to encourage these believers, he didn't get to spend as much time with them as he wanted to. He sends this letter and he sends Timothy to try to encourage them because some of them were confused even about what happens when believers die and Christ coming back again, what's going to happen. And so this is dealing with death. And I pray that God might give you some comfort and some hope today as we look at verses 13 to 18 together. So let's pray, and then we'll look at God's Word together. Father, you are amazing, and you are with us every moment of every day. Our days are numbered. They're in your hands. You know everything about us. And I pray today that you may remove some of the fear and the sting of death, and that we would have hope, and that we would have faith, And I'm asking today that you might give me the words to say and how to say them, that lives may be forever changed. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you're able to stand, would you stand with me? If not, you can keep your seats. But we're going to read these uh, verses together. They'll be on the screen for you. They're also on the sermon outline you received when you came in. But let's look at verses 13 to 18 together. It says this, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You may be seated. All right, several things we'll look at today. The first truth is this, informed to be prepared. We're informed to be prepared. If you look at verse 13, he says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. There is a fear and a fascination that surrounds death. There always has been. Mankind is always fascinated with what's going to happen when we die. If you look in today's media and today's movies, there's all kinds of TV series and movies that deal with the afterlife or ghosts or all kinds of stuff. The truth is, as we talk about the afterlife, what comes after life 
is actually eternal life. Uh, death is not the end. We live on, our souls, our bodies decay away, but our souls, the essence of who you are, lives on, and it lives on in two places depending on what you believe about Jesus Christ. Which is why so much of this hope and encouragement and dealing with death, we need to deal with death in Christ, not apart from Christ. We need to have faith in him and trust in him, and then death does not look so scary. What is it about death that makes us so afraid? Part of it is just the unknown. We don't know when we are going to die. And no one can tell you that. Not with absolute certainty. But there are some things about death that we can know. And what we can know should encourage us. Because Jesus gave us the word of God that helps us to know the things that we have to figure out. And a lot of things we don't have to figure out. It's going to be okay. I don't want you to be uninformed. So the truth here that Paul is informing them about is about death, those that are asleep, and we'll come back to that in a minute. I like what John MacArthur wrote. He said, Paul's concern was not just doctrinal, but pastoral. His intent was not to give a detailed description of the rapture, but to comfort the Thessalonians. The intent of the other two passages in the New Testament that discuss the rapture, John 14, verses 1 to 3, and 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 58, is also to provide comfort and encouragement for believers, not to fuel their prophetic speculations. He wanted us to be comforted. He wanted us to know some stuff without trying to guess and speculate everything that the rapture might entail and the second coming of Christ and the judgment. We need to be informed by the Bible. I would encourage you not to let others inform you, uh, not even the Left Behind movies, okay? They're interesting to watch, but some of that stuff, you need to get your theology not from media, but from the Word of God, because that's where we'll be really encouraged. Look at verses 16 to 17. In those, he tells us what's going to happen. Not everything that's going to happen, but some pretty cool things that will happen that will announce Jesus is back. Verse 16 says, The Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Now what happens first? The Lord Himself will descend from heaven. This is going to be amazing. It, it, it is going to be huge, and at that moment, there will be a shout. The first thing we see here is a shout. The word kalusma, shout, it's a military command. It, it, it carries the idea of supreme authority. When, when the Lord comes back, when he descends from heaven and he shouts, all of creation is going to hear and listen. When, when I talk, a lot of times people don't listen to me. It's kind of frustrating, especially with my kids. I'm like, I'm trying to tell you something. This is important. You should hear this. When the voice of the creator of the universe speaks, the voice that actually created the universe, remember? He said it. He spoke into existence the universe. When that voice speaks again, in that shout, the world and the universe will hear. Second, there'll be the voice of the archangel. The the shout and now a sound the voice of the archangel what what will the archangel say again we're not told i'd like to know uh when we think about jude 1 9 it talks about michael this archangel and what's he going to cry out and while there's no certainty i can imagine him getting the heavenly host ready the archangel talking to the angels and saying now is the time let us join in this rejoicing it's here it's now so the, the voice of the Creator Jesus shouts, and then the archangel says, all right, it's time, and then they go, and then the trumpet sounds. The signal, the trumpet of God. Again, attention and warning and declaration, and then now it's time. This is huge. And then he says, I know there's a lot of things you don't know about death, but, death, but know this, the dead in Christ will rise first. 
Then those that are alive and remain will be caught up together in the air and be with them together with the Lord there. And it says you'll be with the Lord always. Always. Caught up. That's where you get the word rapture here. Harpazo. It means to grab or to seize suddenly, to snatch or to take away. When this happens, I mean, it's going to happen fast, but you need to know that in that moment, those that have already died in Christ and those that are in Christ now will be reunited and be together with the Lord forever. And that is extremely good news. That helps us to deal with death. We need to be aware just that God is real and God is coming back. Those things give us perspective on life and death. Are you prepared to die? That's kind of a crazy question. What do you mean by that? Typically, we think of uh, logistical things or practical things like we need to write our last will and testament and maybe get some burial insurance. I mean, we think of all of these physical type of things, trying to get our affairs in order. But I would encourage you that apart from all the physical things that you need to do to get ready to die, the most important thing you need to do to get ready to die is spiritual. And it's about getting right with God through Jesus. And then you're ready. And then, when you're informed and you're prepared, then no matter when that happens, you are going to be okay. And better than okay, you're going to be great. So being informed to be prepared. God told you so, so that you could get ready. He says, this is coming. And the gray hairs on your head or beard remind you that it might be a little closer than it was yesterday. But the reality is we need to get ready now. And we'll talk about that even more next week. The second truth I want us to see is encouraged to believe and grieve differently. So we're informed to be prepared, but we're also encouraged to believe and grieve differently. How we process death, the death of those that we love. Many of you have been to a grave recently and had to walk through this valley of death, and it is not an easy thing to do. In fact, I would encourage you Hope for the hurting. This Wednesday night Bible study we're doing with Tony Evans is really good, and there's some solid scriptures that help encourage us when we're dealing with grief. But when you look at the Word of God right here, He encourages us to believe, and because of our belief, to grieve differently. He says in the rest of verse 13, so that you will not grieve as the rest who do not have hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For we say this to you by the word of the Lord, that those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Grieve differently. Why? At the most basic level, because death is not the end. When we look at death, we see it through such a, a finality. Instead of seeing it as a doorway, we see it as a dead end, literally. But it's not. It is a doorway to the next phase of existence. Death is not the end. When you think about how much it hurts, he doesn't tell you not to grieve. We're, we're going to hurt when people that we love die. That's, that is normal. That is part of life. But he says when you grieve, grieve differently. And, and I've talked to people, for example, a, a woman who lost her husband, and, and she's asking me, is it wrong for me to grieve? She, she said, I, I read a scripture today, Philippians 4.4, 4, it says, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say again, rejoice. And she says, I don't feel like rejoicing, I feel like weeping, I feel like giving up. Am I even allowed to grieve? And I said, yes, Absolutely. Absolutely. You can rejoice even through tears. You can hope even in the midst of unbearable sorrow when you realize that death is not the end. Jesus wept. It's not wrong to weep. It's not wrong to hurt and to grieve. There's a huge difference, though. If you look at verse 13, he says, I don't want you to grieve like, like what? The rest of the world that has no hope. You can grieve, but don't be hopeless in your grief. Don't be hopeless in your grief. Not as the world grieves, we grieve differently. Our heart may be shattered. 
But we've got to continue to live even when we don't feel like it. We have to hope because we trust in Jesus. And, and then when you're dealing with stuff like this, guys, don't trust the way you feel. Your emotions can be deceived and you can be misled by them. Don't trust in your feelings. Trust in the solid word of God. Let that inform what you know. And then what you know will change how you feel and how you grieve and how you live. I believe that we need to be broken, but not unbelieving. You can be broken, but not unbelieving. Verse 14 says, If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those that have fallen asleep in Jesus. Jesus rose from the grave. He defeated death itself. But I love how he starts to talk about death now. If you look in the New Testament, do you notice how it always talks about death and now it uses the phrase fallen asleep? Those that have fallen asleep in Christ? Isn't that an amazing, different way to see death? Those that have fallen asleep in Christ. Now, your body dies. But your soul lives on. To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. There's so many scriptures that encourage you. But if you have this idea of death being fallen asleep in Christ, I think about my children, and I've been able to hold them as they, as they fall asleep. And just looking throughout the sanctuary, I've seen several babies here today. And I see moms and I see grandmas that are holding a baby. And that baby falls asleep in your arms. And they're there. And they're protected. And then that baby wakes up. Sleep is temporary. So is death. Death is temporary. And if you think about your loving Heavenly Father that holds you in Christ and in His arms, death doesn't look so scary anymore. You fall asleep in Christ. And that's how you die as a believer. Believe in Jesus, what he said. If you believe that Jesus died, again, there's, there's a conditional thing here for the hope that you're supposed to have and the, the way to grieve differently. He says, if you believe that Jesus died, and it, it doesn't suggest a doubt here, but a logical sequence. Like, if this happens, then this happens. If you believe that Jesus died and he was buried and he rose again, then you need to know that you too will rise again. If you believe in the resurrection, you need to also believe then that your resurrection is real too. If Jesus defeated death for all that believe in him and you believe in him, then he has defeated your death. If this happens, then this happens. And he's like, you know what? Know this. Believe this. Be encouraged by this. To believe now and grieve differently because you are in Christ and he is in you. That's what makes death also a celebration. Even though it's hard for us, we celebrate what they have gained and what we one day too will gain. We believe that he died. We believe that he rose again. 1 Peter 2, 24, it's not on your outline, but it says he bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That's what he's done on the cross for us. T.E. Wilson notes that death has been changed to sleep by the work of Christ. It is an apt metaphor in which the whole concept of death is transformed. Believe. Believe in Jesus. I mean, that's really the simple thing about life. What's life really all about as we've been going through this book together? The short answer is this life is really all about Jesus. Believe in Him and worship Him. Your life is not about you, it's about Him. You figure that out, and man, everything else is, is beautiful. Your whole life and your work becomes worship unto the Lord. All these things we've been talking about build and progress but if you believe that jesus is real he's the son of god and your faith is in him all of a sudden now because of your belief in jesus you will both live and die and grieve differently differently so we are informed to be prepared we are encouraged to believe and grieve differently and finally we are comforted to be hopeful, comforted to be hopeful. Look at verse 17 and 18 again. It's on the screen for you. 
We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Always means always. Eternal life. Always. You will always be with the Lord and in the Lord if you become a believer and a follower of Christ today. It is a never-ending relationship. And that not only should comfort your heart, but it should comfort those around you that are asking these serious questions about life and death, that are battling terminal diseases and not sure where to turn, that are looking and wondering if a God could ever even love them or forgive them. And the answer is yes. God can love you. God can forgive you. God can help you. You just got to come to Him and believe in Him. And then you will always be with the Lord. Comfort in Christ. Again, we see that phrase so often that we almost skip past it. But this is all possible in Christ. Not apart from Him. How do I handle the big issues without Christ? See, the sad thing is people are going to have hardships whether they believe in Christ or not. Right? There's going to be hurt in this life. And many people are going to need some comfort. The only question is where are you going to turn, for, turn to for, those, for, that, for that comfort, for that help? Sometimes we'll turn to relationships, which can be good or bad, depending on the relationships. But I tell you, if you turn to a person to try to fill the void in your heart, you'll always fail unless that person is the God-man Jesus Christ. Because there is something in your heart and soul that no other person, no spouse, no relationship, no boyfriend or girlfriend can fill. If you try to find your identity and your strength in a relationship with someone else, you will constantly be disappointed. Unless you find your identity in Christ and your strength in your relationship with Him, then you will find eternal comfort and something strong enough to get, through, to get you through the tough times. Where do people turn to when they're dealing with sorrow and grief? Not on your outline, but I was reminded of Ephesians 5, 18. It says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Many times people will try to numb their pain. They'll get drunk on wine. They'll get drunk on strong drinks or drugs. They try to numb the pain of life, but it never, ever stops. In fact, if they start down this path, and I know because I've been on this path, you have to have more and more, and you just keep drinking, and you just keep going, and you never find peace. In fact, when things become more clear, you're more frustrated than you were before you started. It won't work. We need to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit of God instead of the other, under the influence of all the other things we do to numb the pain of See, God will, not, God will not just help you to get through this life. He'll help you to be victorious in this life. And that comes not by numbing your pain, but by walking with you through that pain and helping you to deal with the root and the issue of that pain. And that's what God does for us. We have to turn to Him and believe in Him. In fact, you need to understand that whether you believe in Jesus or not, Jesus is the Lord. Whether you trust him in, or not, in him right now or not, he's still the Lord. He, he doesn't need your affirmation or your approval. He, he's, he's God. But don't doubt that one day you'll face him, because we, we will. The Bible tells us we'll all face him. Romans 14, verse 7 to 9, also not on your outline, so I'll say it one more time. Romans 14, verse 7 to 9 says, For not one of us lives for himself. And not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and of the living. God's real. Jesus is real. He's the Lord of the living and the dead, and he can help you with everything you face in life. 
And when you look at verse 15 again, this is not an empty promise. The reason Paul could write this, he says, we say this to you, we say this to you by the word of the Lord, that this is what's going to happen, and this is what death looks like in Christ. It's not just an idea, it's a promise that in Christ we'll live forever. And in Christ, we can grieve and find strength and comfort to live well. So be comforted by the Word of God. Yesterday, we went to the antique tractor show at Discovery Park. Uh, These are a picture of some of the tractors there. I know some of you were there because I saw you with the tractors. I saw the raspberries there. They had two tractors. They had all these tractors lined up, antique tractors. And The kids loved it because you could walk all the way up and all the way down the line and see all these different antique tractors. And uh, they, you know, they wanted to climb on every one of them. And I was like, some of them you can climb on, some of them you can't. These are to look at. These are display tractors. Do you see this guy behind you looking at you? Don't put your peanut butter hands on his tractor, okay? (laughs) Display only. Just look at them. We went all the way down. They thought it was fun. Then we went inside. And something amazing happened. We were on the inside of the children's museum we were upstairs and they looked out the window and they said dad dad come quick come quick and i was like okay what what the tractors were moving these antique tractors all of a sudden sparked to life and they got in a row and they started doing this big parade all the way around so we went down and saw these tractors moving they were driving around these tractors were old but still running and I thought, that reminds me a lot of me. Santa Claus can still get it done. I'm still, I'm still moving around. I'm old, but I'm okay. okay. I'm okay. How long are they going to keep running? I, I don't know. But I tell you this. You may be getting older, but you are still a vital part of the Lord's harvest. It is time to shake off the rust and get moving again. You're not meant for display you're meant to be working for the lord and furthering his kingdom we're not just to sit around guys we got a lot to do and the truth is god can use you to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth god can use you to comfort someone in their grief right now to let them know that death is not the end god could use you to open his word and say you know what there's life eternal life in Jesus Christ and all you got to do is accept it and it's yours let's pray father thank you so much that you created us for your glory thank you that you're not done with any of us yet there's work to do there's opportunities we have to serve and we don't want to waste any of them you've put people in our life for us to bless and encourage and speak truth to and I'm I'm asking God that we would deal with death differently because of you we need to be informed so that we're prepared we want to be encouraged to believe and to grieve differently and we need to be comforted so that we're hopeful because hope is a very contagious and powerful thing we could share the hope that we have in you with others and they they could begin to be hopeful they could believe that there is a god that loves them a god that died for them a god that is willing to live through them and to help them with the difficulties of life. This life is about you. We're created for your glory. Help us, God. Help us to love you back. Help us to serve you while we're here with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I pray for those that are here that that may have seen this stand of baptism today and they're like, you know what, I need a relationship with Jesus. If you need to come for salvation or baptism or You're looking for a church family where you could plug into and grow. And God's telling you, now is the time. This is the day. Listen to him. Share that. Don't be afraid. And we will rejoice in the Lord together. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.